So I'd like to introduce him. He's going to bring us a wonderful message this morning. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. I've asked Chris to pass some stuff out while I just give a brief introduction about who I am. My name is Jeremy Lau. I am the founder and senior leader of a revival ministry based in Bethlehem called Ekbalo Harvest. Turn to your neighbor and say, Ekbalo Harvest. Ekbalo Harvest is a Greek word. It is the word that Jesus used when he said, look out into the field. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to give yourself to persistent, deliberate, intentional prayer because it is when you do that that the laborers will be sent with power to go deliver, heal, and save souls. Interestingly, that Greek word ekbalo is also the word used in Greek when it says to cast out a demon, to cast out a devil, or to throw out with great violent force. And so what we see in this picture is that if we want to see more and more evangelistic outreaches and crusades like we are having with the Festival of Life here in the Lehigh Valley, it's not going to come but by extraordinary prayer. In fact, Jonathan Edwards, when he was asked, how is it that your ministry is thriving and causing what we now know as the Great Awakening? He attributed it to this. He said, It comes through extraordinary prayer. What is extraordinary prayer? Well, I believe extraordinary prayer comes when we do two things. One, when we go beyond our comfort zone to give ourselves to day and night prayer. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the message today. But then secondly, that extraordinary prayer comes when we get past our preferences, our denominational opinions, And we recognize Christ in our fellow brother and sister, regardless of if they believe slightly different things than we do. And we say, but I still see the risen Lord in your heart, abiding in you. And because of that, I will give myself to unified, unprecedented prayer. And it is in that place that the Psalms declare how blessed it is when brethren dwell in unity. It is like the oil that flows down Aaron's beard. And what is the oil in the Old Testament was a symbol for the anointing or the presence and the power of Holy Spirit to save, to heal, and deliver. Amen? Amen. And so I have been here in the Lehigh Valley a little under two years. I was studying to be a missionary and a children's pastor at a Bible college in California. And I actually thought that I was going to be a long-term missionary in Bethlehem, Israel, and Jerusalem. I had actually lived there for close to three months in the fall of 2014, right in the peak of the Gaza Strip War. Through a series of events, I ended up getting severely sick and ended up coming home to the States, ended up at the International House of Prayer in Kansas City and reconnected with uh, one of my best friends who lives in Nazareth. And if any of you remember that winter, it was a pretty harsh winter. I decided to fly. He decided to drive. His car had over 250,000 miles on it, and rust was basically the only thing holding up the engine. And his mechanic, from what he tells me, is, you're crazy if you do this, because it'll be a miracle if your car gets you there. It'll be another miracle if your car gets you back. And it'll be a third miracle if your car still works after it gets you there and back. If I was you and you seem to be a praying man, I'd probably ask a friend to drive with you, just in case. So a mutual friend of ours flew from Los Angeles to Philadelphia, and the plan was that those two would drive from Kansas City and back. We got to the conference in December 2014, and much to our surprise, the friend who had driven with the one from Nazareth said, I actually have to take the train back to California. And so I thought I was being a good friend and decided, sure, Christian, I'll drive back with you. Little did I know the surprise that the Lord had for me. The night before we left, the conference that we were attending was um, being hosted by IHOP, and they had brought in an evangelist by the name of Reinhard Bunke. And at that time, he had a prophetic word burning in his heart that the Lord in 2015 was going to raise up 200 apostolic and prophetic young adults to be sent into the nation of America as missionaries and revivalists to carry the DNA of prayer evangelism, the supernatural, and intimacy with Jesus. And those four aspects would be the four key ingredients that would be the message that they would preach. 
I felt the Lord literally shoot this burning, fiery arrow into the depths of my inner man. And he spoke out of Jeremiah 6.16. And he said, hey, just let you know, you're not just going to the East Coast for a fun little, you're helping out your friend. Stand and ask for the ancient path, Jeremy, for there you will find the rest that this nation needs. Now, I've been in what is known as the global prayer movement since 2009. I am well aware of the Moravians and the history of over 110 years of perpetual prayer that resulted in what we now know as the modern missions movement. What I didn't know, what I had never bothered to study in my history, is, is that when the Moravians sent missionaries all over the earth, They actually wanted to evangelize the United States. They wanted to reach the colonists and the Native Americans. I didn't know that they settled in the East Coast. So when I got here, and as I'm touring through Nazareth and Bethlehem, seeing the different sites, this fire begins to burn in my belly again. And I'm thinking, surely there is a house of prayer or a church here that understands the prophetic destiny and heritage that the Moravians have left behind. And much to my dismay, I saw that there was no single church or no ministry or no house of prayer. And the Lord said, that's because I have waited for such a time as this to bring you here. To give you an anointing to rally the church, to rally every generation from the youngest to the oldest. From every denomination that believes in the moral authority of the word of God and the essentials of the Christian faith. Who has a desire to see unprecedented revival. And so in July of 2015, I moved out here, gave myself to raising support as a missionary, took a part-time job, and I continued to fluctuate between preaching itinerantly, writing books, and there are two books that I've brought at the table, and I'll explain those in a moment, and then raising support as a missionary, living this life of faith in the two or almost two years that I've been here. We have seen over 400 different people from five different states come through our prayer meetings. We've seen people get healed, delivered. We've seen several marriages that were on the brink of divorce get totally restored. God is moving in this day through extraordinary prayer because he actually has an end-time agenda. And so... In order to help simplify things, because the message, I believe, is so urgent in the days in which we live, and I don't know too many people who are necessarily preaching it in this area, I've written two books, and I want to give them away. Is there anybody who had a birthday this week or this month? So I want to give you one of the books. This orange one is entitled, Let the Incense Arise. It comes from the scriptural mandate in Malachi 1, verse 11, which says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord will be made great as incense arises from every place. And what it is, is it is a prophetic declaration that as we reach the end of times, the Lord is going to release the spirit of intercession within entire regions Not every city, but within regions. We know that Holy Spirit was promised that he would fall on them on Pentecost, and we're in that 50-day period, and that from that outpouring, it would not just affect the city of Jerusalem, but it would affect the region of Judea. I believe prophetically that the Lehi Valley is one of the regions that Malachi prophesies about. I believe with all of my heart that God honors the foundational prophetic destiny. And when the Moravians came here, I want to read this to you. This was one of the songs that they sang when they christened Bethlehem. At Christ's manger, freed from danger, clan of sinners, taste the rapture. You may capture by the price his passion pays. He is candid when demanded, who are you and from what place? Lost he found me and to himself bound me. Bethlehem's crib gave me this grace. My tortured savior, thy behavior still in Philadelphia's stay. They who cherish ought else perish and Leo they see his way. Stripes ordained and thus sustained by thee freely given our bliss. Let their healing be our ceiling, that our towns may witness this. 
Now, for those of you who poetry in English is not your strong point, basically what the Moravians were declaring prophetically through him was that they believed the anointing of God was upon them to establish this little city called Bethlehem and that it would literally be a place where the presence of Christ would be birthed in apostolic, prophetic, and evangelistic means to reach the entire towns and that it would actually be a part of helping the city of Philadelphia fulfill her prophetic destiny to be the city of brotherly love. One of the words that the Lord gave me for not just the city of Bethlehem but for the Lehigh Valley is is that I believe scripturally that the key of David that the book of Revelation and Isaiah talks about to bind and to loose revival and the open portal of heaven is found in the state of Pennsylvania. It's why our state is called the Keystone State. Oftentimes, if you talk to prophets and prophetic voices, they'll say, well, Philadelphia has the governmental anointing. I believe that's true. But if you just look at the fruit of a city, Harrisburg, with what is going on with Global Celebration and Life Center, has the supernatural anointing. Scripture says in the presence of two or three witnesses, a eh? matter is established on the earth as it is in heaven. How do we see those two cities having their witness come together? Who's in between it? Allentown, Easton, Bethlehem, the Lehigh Valley. We are what I believe Isaiah would call the highway of holiness, who our prophetic destiny is through unprecedented unity unprecedented fasting and prayer and day and night worship when we come together to realize we are part of a divine romance that is culminating in a glorious victorious bride arrayed in fine linen clean and bright full of the holy spirit when we grab a hold of that reality and we say oh if our heritage, if our foundation prophetically is the Moravian heritage of 24-7 worship and prayer, and the scriptures declare that before the end times come, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is going to be made great, Amen. then what is our right response other than to give ourselves wholeheartedly to this radical prayer movement? And so that is what I've been doing here as I've been coming and preaching at different churches, networking with different ministry leaders, I do believe that the prophetic mandate to see this happen as a successful prayer movement is twofold. I believe that the Lord has specifically called me to establish a 24-hour revival center and house of prayer in the city of Bethlehem that would serve as a hub. I was at a meeting with a, a few leaders, and the Lord gave them a revelation for the word hub. If you're a note taker, write this down. Hub equals healthy, unified believers. But I also believe that the Lord is wanting to raise up hubs in the northern, eastern, western, and southernmost parts of the valley. Perhaps you will be a hub. But that is for you, Living Stone Fellowship, to get on your knees corporately in prayer and fasting and say, Lord, what is our prophetic destiny? What is the upward call in Christ? And so that is the twofold mission that I have is to establish a 24 center house of prayer, inviting people from all over the valley to come to see it as a forerunner model. But then my second hope is that when people grab a hold of that, knowing that we're living in an area where the terrain and the weather is not as nice as Southern California, we are going to need multiple houses of prayer, multiple hubs, because geographically it's just not practical to have 24 hour prayer in the valley in a way that is safe. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I have written the book, Let the Incense Arise, to help give the theological foundation of what the house of prayer is. Prior to that, I wrote another book, the 40-day manual or devotional for learning how to build a lifestyle of transformational prayer. The scripture says in Isaiah 2 that it shall be said in the last days that the mountain of the Lord will be raised up over every mountain. There are prophetic voices that have sociologically looked at society and they've defined there are seven main mountains to society. Religion, family, education, government, business, art and entertainment, and then media and communication. In order for us to have successful intercession that actually invades and transforms society with the revival power of the gospel, we have to be able to know how to ask 
pointedly and declare prophetically because the scripture says you have not because you ask not. And so I co-wrote this with my pastor. Is there somebody here who has been a prayer warrior for more than 25 years? And you just, so then I want to give you this. And if either one of these books seems like something that you'd like to get, you can get them at the back table after service. But with that, let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us the grace of intercession this morning. Even now, Holy Spirit, we don't ask for you to come. We thank you that you're already here. And we release you from our inner man to flow and fill the tank of this room from our bellies. I ask you for the renewed mind to fill every heart and every mind here in this room that we would be so undone as we wait in your presence, as we bask in your glory. Father, we thank you that we get to be a part of launching in the place of prayer for the festival of life. And right now we declare, life shall go forth in Allentown in the name of Jesus. We gather as the ecclesia, as the governing body in heaven, and we agree together in unity that this is the week that the Lord has made for unprecedented salvation, unprecedented healing, unprecedented deliverance. We declare that the harvest is ready and there shall be a great reaping. Not just a signing of the name on a dotted card and leading people into a sinner's prayer, but we decree and declare transformed lives. We decree and declare baptisms of the Holy Spirit. We decree and declare in the name of Jesus that spiritually dead, dry bones will come to life. And out of those who shall be saved, they will become part of a mighty remnant army to the glory of Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I am all over and have no idea where I am at these notes. The reason why I just let you know whenever I preach, I have stopped using the PowerPoint because these are scriptures that have been so burned on the inside of me. I made a deal with the Lord that said, Lord, if you call me into this ministry to preach, there are so many people who are much better public speakers than I am with their PowerPoints and their clearly thought out outlines and their fill in the blanks. And that's good. But the scripture says, Paul, in speaking to the churches, you have many teachers, but not many fathers. What is the difference between a spiritual teacher and a spiritual father? Spiritual fathers not only teach, but they impart what they actually possess. I don't ever want to be behind the pulpit knowing that there is double accountability and double honor before the throne of God for this position. I never want to go at the end of a service and stand before the Lord as I pray, Lord, I just ask that the word of the Lord would run swiftly, that anything that was of you would stick and anything that was of me would fall to the wayside. I don't want to go back after I do the service today and go back to the prayer closet and hear the Lord say, you totally did that in your own strength. You didn't release what I put in you. And so I apologize if there's no clear PowerPoint. I'm just going to speak like a fire hydrant. I'm just going to release the word of the Lord on you. And I'm going to believe that what he has imparted to me, I have authority to give to you. Because freely we received, freely we have the authority to give. Paragraph one talks about the dynamics of the early church. Because when it comes to building a healthy culture of prayer in a region... You know, the buzzword ever since I moved out here has been revival, transformation, revival, transformation. How many of you have heard those words tossed around the last two years? I have found that it is often easy to fall into the deception of talking about revival and idolizing revival without actually rolling up our sleeves and getting in the trenches of a lifestyle that produces revival. Acts 2.42 says the early church devoted themselves to four things. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now what's interesting in Hebrew thought is that four represents the letter Dalet. Dalet was the symbol of the door. When we prophetically understand that these four ingredients have a prophetic anointing on them to release the open doors of heaven, then we are inspired to say, I will devote myself to being in community to these four things. That word devoted means to be intentional, to be deliberate when you feel it, and when you don't. 
even there we see patterns of four. Do you see how prophetic those patterns are again and again in Scripture? And we read through them and we don't ever see them because we're not actually slowing down and saying, Holy Spirit, as I read through this, I need rhema. I need revelation. I need daily bread. I don't just need to read through the stories and say, ah, I checked, I did my Bible study. Like, when we read the word, pray through the word. As you pray through the word, Holy Spirit is able to illuminate the word. Paragraph B, what we see when we have these four foundational ingredients in our church is we get Revival and transformation, an outbreak of glory. And awe came upon every soul. Many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions, belongings, and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Here's my favorite part. And day by day, they attended the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. And they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I believe that we are living in a day where the Lord has said, if you want revival, you won't get it. You don't embrace the radical. Radical means day by day, you guys. There should not be a day when this church building is closed throughout the week. Ouch. But more than that, it's not just a religious duty to say, well, I got to get to all the camp meetings because we have that in America's history. We've gone through seasons in the last 40 years as the Lord has been increasing the revival in the nation where camp meetings began to be held and revival services weekly began to break out in churches. And guess what ended up happening? The spirit of religion came in because then it all became about the service, the show, and the program. The balance is day by day they attended the temple together, but they were also breaking bread in their homes. The church is meant to be an organic body, not an organization. When was the last time that you opened up your home to have a meal, to pray, to prophesy over one another? I thought my home's not clean. What are they going to think? Who cares? Is not the kingdom of God of more importance? Day by day, attending the temple together in genuine fellowship. One of the things that is scary in the church that we live in today is the statistic from Barna shows that over 80% of young adults who grow up in the church and then go to college do not return to the church. 80%. Our churches are slowly shrinking. And outside of the hip pop culture churches that I would offer is not a healthy model because it doesn't foster true community accountability and discipleship. It only markets to the consumerism mentality of Western society. We've got a problem. The solution starts when we give ourselves to prayer, both in the church and in our homes. And I'm not just talking about the the generic prayers, because it's easy. It is easy to fall into a religious mentality of, well, we're going to pray for the issue of abortion, and you can think of four or five people who are all going through hell in their, their situations, whether it's premarital pregnancy, or you can think of this youth and that youth, or we're going to pray for marriage, and you can think of those people. And we have this, this awkward tension of, well, what's appropriate, what's not? There are certain elements to prayer in a corporate prayer meeting in a church that are not appropriate for the general public just by virtue of honoring people that's why we see in this text that the culture of prayer was both at the larger scale and at the intimate scale where you could really get down to the nitty gritty because I've been in churches where they've tried to kind of force everything well we're just going to have the prayer meetings at the church and what ends up happening is the prayer meeting becomes the gossip circle and we want to avoid that 
We want to avoid that at any cost because, again, the kingdom of God is built on people. People's hearts matter. Am I making any sense? Okay. We're going to turn the page. I'll let you read those parts on your own. When it comes to the basic theology for corporate prayer, sociologically, we've already seen this morning that prayer happens at least on two levels. It happens at the intimate level, and then it happens at the corporate level, which I would also call the congregational level. But then when it comes to the house of prayer, thinking back on that passage in Malachi 1.11, incense day and night will arise in every place, there's a third level to prayer at a corporate aspect, and it's what I would call the regional level. So we have our home level, that intimate level, congregational level within our local churches, and then regional where churches are saying there's a bigger picture than building up the health of our ministry. It's for the sake of seeing the kingdom of God advancing in our region so that our region has a testimony of Jesus. And what did Jesus himself say was going to be the number one fruit for a world to see that we were his disciples by our love for one another? I will make a confession to you. I was shocked when I moved out here because I have ministered in many different states in a couple of different countries. I have never ministered in a place that is as territorial as the Lehigh Valley. Amen. Literally, I would have meetings lined up for the day because I try to do four or five meetings in a day. That way I'm not having a million meetings throughout the week. I would literally meet with one pastor in the morning and that one pastor would speak ill about the other pastor, knowing, not knowing that I was going to have lunch with that pastor as soon as my meeting was done. And then, much to my surprise, this is a real story, you guys. That pastor badmouthed the pastor that I just met with, not knowing that I had just come with the meeting. I can think of at least eight or nine accounts where that happened, and then I would be in the, the, the public meetings, and these pastors would be smiling with one another, and... Asking questions, so how's the ministry going? How are tithes? How's the people? That's not unity. Unity comes when we honor, when we love unconditionally. But what does honor mean? Honor, in my opinion, is to think more highly of the other person than you do yourself. Which is why when I came out here and I said, Lord, holy moly, This is a territorial area. How the heck am I ever going to move in an anointing that unifies the churches? And the Lord said this, Jeremy, you will have no authority to expect people to join a prayer meeting that you host if you don't honor them first and go to their prayer meetings. Because why? Scripture says, as you want it done to yourself, do unto others. And yet, when we look at the text of Acts, where it says they were attending the temple day by day, they were having those close, intimate settings, God granted them favor. And I would say that for the most part, what Ekbala Harvest is doing has been granted much, much favor. One of the the coolest testimonies that I have of just this year is there was a a rather large church in Easton that the pastor said, "You you will have to network with those pastors for a over a year just for them to get you to trust you. And I said, Lord, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to go in with no other agenda than just to see them blessed, just for them to know, hey, I'm a prayer missionary in the Lehigh Valley. Yes, this is what I'm doing, but I just want to, how can I serve you? No strings attached. I'm not even asking for you to come to my prayer meeting. I just want to honor you. What I was told would take over a year took one month. And that very same church actually honored me to the point where they had me as their guest speaker for their Good Friday service. Their senior pastor was actually supposed to preach their Good Friday service up at the Stroudsburg campus. So it was an honor in one sense because he let me take his main campus for Good Friday. How many, you know, that's a pretty big deal. But then he gave me the double honor because he actually ended up attending the service. He felt prompted by the word that day. You know what? I want to go and hear this man speak. I want to hear him share his heart because I know that I don't have the time to go back and listen to the archive. So he actually came 
and the Lord so rocked his socks off that we're actually beginning to talk about future partnership. Amen. Favor with God. And that is the same kind of favor that I believe that if you will walk in unity and honor, he will give to this house. I just felt walking in here so strongly that as I was saying, Lord, okay, I have these notes, I prepared them. This is, I'll be honest, this is the basic message that is the first message that I preach in any church. And it's never the same way twice because I'm always wanting to hear, here's the skeleton, how do you want to make the dry bones come to life? And I felt that the word of the Lord for this place was that you are a house of honor. That you are a house of that will stoop low to wash the other church's feet. And in doing so, you will be recognized in heaven because it says in his word, the first shall be last and the last shall be the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. serve. And I just feel so strongly, even after looking at the pictures of how several people in your group rallied together, I want to encourage you. I want to implore with you. I believe that specifically you have an anointing these next days as you give yourselves to praying for the festival of life and then actually being the physical hands and feet to be like Isaiah and say, I'm not just going to stay behind the safety of my walls and pray. I'm actually going to say, here I am, send me. I believe that the Lord has marked your hands with favor to reach people that if you don't go, will not be reached otherwise. And so I want to implore with you, please pray for the harvest, but then pray like Isaiah, here I am, send me. You don't have to go every night. Go one of the nights, but go. Be the answer. Be his hands and feet. Be his body. Amen? Where are we? Living stones. You know, thank you, thank you. One of the words, and I don't think it's in here. How many of you have ever been to the prayer room? I know that that some of you have been to our prayer room in Bethlehem. Could you just raise your hand if you have? There is a scripture that the Lord gave me for the DNA of the house of prayer. And I don't think it's in the notes. It's not. 1 Peter, oh, it is in the notes, paragraph C, page 2 of Roman numeral 2. The house of prayer is meant to be inclusive and intercessory in the sense that it is inclusive for all people to come, and it is intercessory in the sense that it is meant for us to pray not only for ourselves, not only for the needs that we know personally, not for the needs of our church, our city, our region, but for the nations. Okay? The Lord said, Jeremy, when you establish the house of prayer, do not call it Ekbalo Harvest House of Prayer. Yes, Lord, okay. But what do you want to call it? He said, call it Mosaic. Now, how many of you know that mosaics are these beautiful, colorful pieces of art that are made up of tiny, fractured, broken, jaded, rough around the edges pieces? And yet each and every one of those pieces are fearfully and wonderfully made stones. And the Lord said to me, the house of prayer is not meant to be any one ministry. It's meant to be a mosaic. The genuine house of prayer that scripture talks about that will be to serve a region is meant to be built up of the pieces of that region where you don't have to confine to a certain model. That's why the concert of prayer movement a few years ago did not last because it only catered to the middle mo- the, the, the middle mold. Well, we're not going to rock the boat. We're not going to be too conservative and not too charismatic because we just we want unity, but that unity demanded conformity. Biblical unity In the spirit, because Ephesians 4 says that there's one Father, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and it is our charge to preserve the unity. It's not the church's job to create it. It is our mandate to maintain it. Whose job is it to produce unity in the church? Holy Spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
in the context of a house of prayer, a practical biblical model for regional unity that maintains the love of God, honoring Christ in our brother and sister who is the hope of glory, with an attitude of you. Humility and unity in the bond of the spirit of peace. There's freedom for you to be who God has made you to be. I love teaching through the book of Ephesians because it starts out with our individual calling in chapter 1 and 2. Then the latter half of chapter 2 all the way through chapter 4 talks about how God is building a building, a bride, and a body. Think of a bodybuilding bride. Then he goes on to say how this church that is a bodybuilding and bride is meant to gather in corporate worship. And he says, know that the days that you live in are evil. Therefore, be wise. Do not be drunk on alcohol, but be being filled with the spirit. And then he goes on to describe what that spirit filled corporate life looks like as you address one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual prophetic songs. Submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ. What is Paul saying? In the economy of God's kingdom, when you gather together in unity, everybody in God's kingdom gets a turn to lead. Because everybody has Holy Spirit living inside them. That means when it's Jamie's turn to lead, the way that God has made Jamie to host a prayer meeting, we celebrate that, we honor that. But then when it's Chris's turn to lead the meeting, We submit to that. We honor that submitting one to another out of reverence for Christ. And so as the Lord began to speak this to me, he highlighted 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What is Peter saying? You are both the new covenant priesthood, and you are also the house that the priests minister in. And you may be a little rough around the edges. You may be broken. But his love makes all things work together for your good because you are chosen. Romans says, and he makes all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called or chosen for his good purposes. And when we recognize that his good purposes not only impact our personal life, but our corporate life within our local congregation and within our region, We can begin to say, God, build a house of prayer. Build the mosaic. That the glory of God would be birthed through extraordinary unity. I feel like that's probably an appropriate place to bring an end of the worship team. Do you guys do that? Turn to page four. I'm in the process of writing a third book on the Song of Songs. And so the bridal paradigm is burning in my heart. For our day of prayer, usually I'm the one who preaches for our Encounter God service, but when we have it here in two weeks, it'll actually be a guest minister, Dennis Renier, who's an amazing prophetic and apostolic voice. But this whole last year, I've been taking our services through the fivefold paradigm because I believe God is wanting to give a shift practically in how we structure our ministries. But then, as we have been approaching the end of the series, the Lord has been saying, the message for this next season is calling the bride of Christ to pray with desperation, longing for the return of the bridegroom. The spirit and the bride say, come. And I just want to point your attention to paragraph E. Because the end times agenda of the Lord, when you read the story, he's going to build a bride. He's not coming back for this weak, wimpy church. I'm just going to speak openly here. I don't know where your end times theology ends. I don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. I can't find it in scripture. 
Paul says, at the sound of the last trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled and we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. If I read the end of the book, what is the last trumpet? It's the seventh trumpet. It is after the seven seals. So at some point, whether you believe that it's mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, the context of scripture, there's no pre-tribulational trumpet sounding. Why? Because Jesus says in the Gospels, this is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. A farmer, which is me, I'm going to sow revival seeds of wheat into the field of the earth. And my enemy is going to come and he's going to sow tares. And the angels are going to want to rapture the church early. And I'm going to say, hold the horse. Let both grow to full maturity. What is that picture saying? It's basically saying, as we go to the end times, dark will get darker in some seasons and some places and regions. But we have great expectancy to hope that there will be regions where light will grow brighter. The issue that is at stake is not just the saving of souls. The gospel of the kingdom of God is meant to impact whole societies, whole nations, government, family, education, business, art, entertainment. The good news is applicable not just to the personal soul, but to every facet of society. Jesus is not coming back until all across the earth there are entire regions that have risen and shine. That's what Isaiah says. Arise and shine, and the nations will come to your glory. And then Paul picks up on that theme in Ephesians, and he says, Awake, awake, O sleeper, and Christ will shine on you. And that's right before he describes the corporate prayer meeting, the 24-hour worship and prayer. It's Ephesians 5. He culminates it in Ephesians 6. So he gives the identity of the building... In chapter 2 through 3, he gives the picture of the bride of Christ in 4 and 5, and then he concludes the book of Ephesians with this bride taking up the full armor of God, praying without ceasing. It is impossible for any single human being to pray 24 hours a day. That's why we need each other. With the full armor of God. God is coming back not only for a pure and spotless bride, but he's coming back for a bride in army boots. He is coming back for a co-equal. When Jesus was on the cross and he said, to Telestai, it's finished. Do you know he didn't actually say it in Greek? He most likely said it in Aramaic or Hebrew. The Hebrew and Greek word for it is finished is kala. Turn to your neighbor and say kala. Kala is a homonym in Aramaic and Hebrew. It also means bride, my equal. When he who knew no sin became sin, and as the first Adam's side was opened up to procure his bride, the last Adam hung there bleeding on a tree, said, Kala, he called forth his bride in love, and as he did that, shortly afterwards, what happened? His side was opened, and out of that came forth blood and water, the very same blood and water that makes you and I his bride. And the end of the story in Revelation is this. The spirit and the bride cry, come. Things are not okay until you come back. Things are not okay until you return. We are meant to be fueled with a lovesick heart in the place of intercession. So if you would stand with me, I just want to pray and bless you. And do whatever you need to do to get into a position of posture. Because right now, Holy Spirit, it's, I just want to confirm what Pastor Gene shared. I was praying in the prep room earlier, and the Lord prompted me to say, commission the angels to come into the room. And he did. And there are actually, from what I can tell, there are six angels there, there are six angels there, there's one angel there, and there's one angel behind me. So we've got seven and seven. We've got a double portion of completeness, and I can see bulls. In their hands. 
to just do as you can. I know this may sound weird, but did you know that our imagination is actually meant to be used by God to help us to interact with the spirit realm? That's why we're supposed to cast down every vain and lofty imagination raised up against the knowledge of God, having the eyes of our understanding renewed so that we can see. So Holy Spirit, right now, anoint our eyes to see what our natural eyes cannot see. We thank you for the presence of the angels that are in this room. And we ask, Lord, that you would show us even now how they are going to pour those bowls of oil and incense over us. I ask for you to sanctify the imagination of my brothers and sisters here. I believe that some of you are going to have very, very faint, quick pictures of it. You're going to see the angels. I know it's going to be an exercise of your imagination, but this is part of spirit-filled living. We didn't come here to just have a message. We came here to engage with the invisible. So yes, Lord, we receive an angelic commissioning today. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, more, more, Lord. Open our eyes to see. Glory, glory, glory. Whoa, more, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Show us what you're doing. Wow. <laughs> Some of you I can see your heads are being anointed with fresh oil. You have the anointing to heal this morning. There's somebody here who woke up and your back pain has been worse than normal. Who is it? Can you go lay your hands on her, please? If you pray in the Spirit, let's just begin to stir up faith in this room. In the name of Jesus, we command every back pain to go. We declare all things made new in Jesus' name. I thank you that even though on the earth there is not a physical musician, we engage the music of heaven, the melodies of heaven. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. The Lord just anointed you to speak healing to broken hearts. Is there somebody here that you just, you actually declared of yourself, I feel depressed this week. Is there somebody in this room that went through that, where your thoughts were being attacked? Over there, can you, can you come up and have her pray for you, please? If you can stay right there, I'm going to have her come up and get, get you. Thank you, Lord. More. More, Lord. She's going to pray for you. She's going to declare wholeness of heart, soundness of mind, and peace, the shalom of Yah. Whoa. 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 Jamie, I hear the Lord speaking a commissioning angel over you and and the, the, the financial anxiety that you overcame. There are people in here who are worrying about their finances that, that, that you have a prayer to release. So if you have been worrying about your finances this week, please have Jamie come and pray for you. Don't be shy. There's an anointing to break the yoke of poverty on this man. Thank you, Lord. Sir, you. Yeah, what's your name? Jermaine. The Lord just put a heart. The angel of the Lord just put a heart in your hand. Can you just hold it out like this? 
For those that are around him, can you please put your hands on him? We're going to commission that the Lord would put the spirit of David on him, that when he plays, demons would flee. In the name of Jesus, your hands are anointed of the Lord. Father, would you use this man mightily to release the heartbeat of heaven? Whoa! Ho! Oh, the breaker anointing! The last thing that I want to close with is if you will just put out your hands like a bowl. It's not like the Lord said that we're to do that. So Lord, we receive the oil of intercession this morning. Whoa. Oh. You anoint us with oil. You anoint our head with oil. Our cup overflows. Ho. Oh. Whoa. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you from this day forward in an increased measure. Whoa. Ho. How many of you are feeling his presence right now? Just lift up your hands because this will help us. More, Lord. Increase it. Double it. Double it. Fire on the hands. For those who aren't yet feeling it, Lord. If you need to sit down to receive, that's okay. We're just going to, there's freedom in this place. There's no right or wrong way. We're just encountering Holy Spirit right now. Whoa. Whoa. I just heard the word prodigal. How many of you have a prodigal in your family that you have been praying for? Just raise up your hand. If you have a prodigal in your family, please come up here. We're gonna we're gonna do something. Whoa, Jesus, birth it. I can feel it. I can feel it in my stomach. I can feel it. Whoa, Jesus. Hold hands. Let's hold hands. Holy Spirit. Whoa. Whoa. More Lord. More Lord. Let's pray after me in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. We, break we break every chain, every chain over, our over our prodigals. We call them home. We loose, we loose spiritual sobriety. Spiritual sobriety. We, loose we loose the love of Yahweh. We speak grace, we speak to, the grace. to the mountain standing in between, in between us and them. And we say, be moved say, into the sea of grace and the sea of love. Now you just pray silently under your breath for your, your loved one. Come. Come, Lord. We call them forth. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are not done with them yet. Loose the angels. Chase them down. Whoa. Ho. We bless you, Jesus. And we give you the honor and praise today. We take this as a sign that this is just the beginning. Yes. To the glory of your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.